A core element of our psyches in this reality is ego. Now also, ego has been subject to attack and misinterpretation, sometimes applied on purpose with confusion and depletion as a goal, but often due to a skewed perception of what it is in our reality. I will not claim to be any kind of expert on the matter, but will try to offer, in this contemplation, the best presentation I can about it, with the intent to assist any who may find it useful. The concept of ego is found both in ancient religion and philosophy, and modern mind sciences such as psychology. In a way, the homunculus argument, which is an interesting subject to research if you haven't yet, is a sort of attempt at defining the ego, at giving it definitive sustenance. While it does fall short, it nevertheless brings to the fore the issue of internal identity in our minds and souls, that is, the eternal question of, who am I? Am I the little man inside my head looking at the uh, Cartesian theater of my external sensory experience? while holding the trigger buttons for my emotional and cognitive responses? Or is that homunculus a device programmed by the external stimuli to perform a task in a certain way? If so, and if the little man ego, so to speak, is merely a device, then where in there is the concrete me that we so much look to know? Nowadays, although we no longer culturally and scientifically accept the homunculus theory as fact, in a way, it still resembles in, in our identification with the ego and the way it works. And if on the one hand we have a push to worship ego and it, its external cultural, social and religious daddy figure, yes, I use daddy instead of father on purpose, as it is a scornful dominating entity and not a truly fatherly one, even if at times it pretends so. And on the other hand, we have ego being given a very bad rep. Which is it then? Is ego to be abolished? Is it to be dissolved? Is it to be full commander of ourselves? Is it a god dwelling within man? Or a demon? Or neither? This question reminds me of one of the intro scenes in the 1982 movie Conan the Barbarian in which a young Conan's father is telling him, Fire and wind come from the sky, from the gods of the sky, but Krom is your god. Krom lives in the earth. Once giants lived in the earth, Conan, and in the darkness of chaos, they fooled Krom and took from him the enigma of steel. Krom was angered and the earth shook. Fire and wind struck down the giants and threw their bodies in the water. But in their rage, the gods forgot the secret of steel and left it on the battlefield. And we who found it are just men, not gods, not giants, just men. Now, I'm not going to discuss any link between what the father tells young Conan with any historical event in this reality. Interesting as it may be, it is not the purpose of this contemplation, nor am I very eager to discuss, hist to discuss history in relation to reality, because 1. We do not have access to all the facts, and 2. Because there is something that the ego in its current state does in its interpretation of history. It filters it, distorts it, even clouds it, to ensure its continued comfort with its decisions. It does so in its own individual history, as well as the collective history it has been involved with externally to itself. What I am going to discuss in relation to that scene in the movie is that the father is basically telling him that the ego god, that is the deity that lives in the earth, residing within the mountain of our skulls, was defined and perhaps formed and taught by the conflict with the threats of nature, a conflict that seems to have stolen from him this relic of great value, there called Enigma or Riddle of Steel, but that can be called by many other names. What did Krom lose exactly in this battle against the terrible environment that beset him? So in my personal contemplation, the ego is indeed a construct, not a defined living being by itself, but automaton in nature, programmed primarily by instinct, 
on another video I mentioned Instinct as being a sort of pre-installed operating system readily running on the Ego interface. And secondarily, by stimuli from the environment, be it physical, social, emotional, and mental. Yet the Ego is a god too, as Krom, who lives in the earth, in the mountain, demanding obedience in exchange for survival, firstly physical, then conceptual. But what made this ego, this god within our minds, go out of control? What made him so angered that the earth shook? What did the giants really steal from him? I postulate, as my own contemplation on the matter, that it was exactly the connection, the communication line, so to speak, which, uh, with its truth, its true essence, if you like, that was stolen or severed, leaving the ego abandoned, stressed and lonesome. Let me go further into that. The construct of ego is like a pet. To me, that is how I like to define it. You can imagine whatever animal you prefer, but hey, I'm a dog person, so let me call it a pooch. This dog is loyal, hardworking, and always focused, on the alert for anything that threatens its loving master. Yet there seems to be no loving master taking care of the ego anymore, does it? Given that the dog lost the connection to its true master, it is like an abandoned pet, trying so hard to find a resemblance of that loving relationship it was created to have, doesn't it? The pet dog, a mere guardian, abandoned as it found itself, had to become its own master, that is, its own god, with its own truth being its own regulator. Yet what does the pet know without its master to decide on whatever comes on its way? He is blind, deserted in a dark place. What severed its connection to the true master then? Well, that is a matter for some fruitful discussion for sure. I freely admit not knowing exactly what or how that happened, but I can, however, sort of forensically, identify that there was supposed to be a connection there linked to the ego from a more powerful source that is there no longer. It was like in the Conan quote I used, just men who found the secret, who had to work with it and learn its discipline by themselves. And such was the trauma that the ego blamed its master for the abandonment and began submerging more and more into the illusory shadow god game that we still live in. Therefore, Krom lost his pet, and his pet lost Krom. They lost contact with each other, that is the whole riddle of steel, the discipline that shows the way to godhood. Its discipline can either be used to re-establish connection to its true master, or it can be used to give the lonesome, abandoned pet the feeling of being its own true master. It is not by chance that the movie begins with Nietzsche's most famous quote. They wanted to show how Conan was, quoting, destined to bear the jeweled crown of Aquilonia, that is, the kingdom of the eagle, or Aquila in Latin, which is an old symbol for the spirit, upon a troubled brow. The crown of the eagle is not for the ego to bear, but for its true absent master, which I consider is our true selves. So the ego became vulnerable to the torture of its hostile environment, filled not only with threats to its body integrity, but also nightmarish other entities outside of its comprehension, appearing far more powerful than the ego itself, more than willing to fill in that vacuum. And so new connections were eventually made, and also new covenants. Blind and total obedience to this opportunistic entity in exchange for survival, comfort and wealth, which is power. The ego thus became, became a servant again, just as it was supposed to be, just as it was made to be, and now a servant of something bigger and in appearance wiser than itself. It was fulfilling its proper function, it seemed, abandoned no more, but found by a master, even if it was not its own true master. It was a place better than no place. 
It was a master better than no master, the ego felt. Yet something has been missing since then, and building up too. As much as this is a surrogate relationship for the one lost, it is not only insufficient in its magnificence, it is also set in opposition to the truth that was taken away. And the ego feels it. It does. It feels that this relationship should be more. It is not the truth it vestigially remembers. I mean, isn't that why we've all been looking all this time? But then the ego pet, who has turned the master's throne room in the mind upside down, uh, gnawed on the furniture and ripped the curtains and so on, feels guilty and does not want to face the true master in case it ever returns. For how can he be forgiven after such a mess? So there is this conflict in the ego, on the one hand pulling it to further cover itself in darkness to prevent the return of the king. Yes, this is a pur purposeful reference to the third chapter of the huge novel by Tolkien, which is to me a story within the human psyche, where Middle Earth is the human mind. Lest he be wrathful, finding all the mess he did in the absence. And... On the other hand, there is another force another uh, force pulling it to surrender to the return of the true master, of the psyche, that will clean up the mess, set things right and bring the pet back to its joyful previous experience. What the pet can no longer remember is that it never heard its true master's voice, because only its false master speaks. Only its false master requires language as a code to communicate instead, that is, in the place of, truth. The true master, he doesn't recall, never speaks, never spoke, yet it communicated with him directly, without time, without illusion, without doubt or refutation. So the ego is confused between these two, yet all it needs is to own up, to right the wrongs within its own grasp, and to accept the return of the connection that it lost somehow, returning to its proper place. Then the truth returns, instantaneously, lovingly and forgivingly. You see, the ego within ourselves is not the enemy. The ego is actually the main victim, while we, that is, our true essence, the ego's true master, while we are absent. <laughs>